I note there's a quorum that's present. Without objections, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear the testimony on the, on the skills gap facing America's workforce. <clears throat> In the past three years, if proven anything, is that America has an extremely resilient workforce. Through the pandemic, we prevailed. Nurses found creative ways to assist patients through telehealth. And truckers showed up day in and day out to get food delivered to Americans' kitchen tables. I'm proud of our resilience. With it, America can overcome any hardship. But our workforce faces another challenge today, the skills gap. Simply put, the skills gap is a growing disconnect between employer needs and employee competencies. Nearly 10 million jobs remain unfilled in the United States. These jobs require in-demand skills, and our workforce system has failed to provide these skills, these skills to American workers. Without swift action, the skills gap is in danger of becoming the skills canyon. <clears throat> there are many reasons for the skills gap, but only with a workforce system that's effectively reskilling and upskilling individuals can we begin to address these issues. Innovations and a fresh approach is needed for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act to achieve its potential and equip more job seekers with the skills needed in the modern economy. Employers across the country are searching for talent. Good paying jobs are available for those who possess the right skills. Yet too few Americans are upgrading their skills through the workforce system. Only about one third of those participating in the YR engage in any type of skills development. Less than 100,000 individuals nationwide completed their programs in the most recent year. We're not going to close the skills gap if we stay on this trajectory. Skill development must be a, a greater priority in the system, but government acting alone cannot meet the historic challenges facing our workforce. Private sector involvement and investment are essential to align skills development programs with industry needs and to give workers hands-on experience. Employee-led and work-based learning must be a focal point in the law. When it comes to skills development, employers must be in the driver's seat. And while skills and competencies, competencies uh, became, become the new currency in the labor market, we cannot continue to support programs in Wayoa that are failing to deliver the skills our economy needs and demands. Reforms are needed to ensure all eligible programs lead to good outcomes. The priority of Wayoa must be to connect job seekers with job granters. At this critical moment, Congress cannot simply double down on the status quo. More taxpayer dollars will not magically fix the problems that are being identified in our workforce system. Today's hearing provides an opportunity for us to hear from experts on these issues and identify solutions together. This is an area where we have a lot of bipartisan agreement. In fact, back in 2014, we found a deal that worked for both sides of the aisle. Legislators, regulators, employers, employees managed to, in countless talks, to responsibly outline a system to connect workers and employers. Those discussions resulted in Wyoming's passage in 2014. At that time, the American government looked very similar to, to what's happening today. A Democrat was in control of the White House, Democrats were in control of the Senate, and the Republicans were in control of the House. I hope with good faith discussions, once again, we can reach an agreement that reforms and strengthens Wyoming, delivering results for the job seekers, job creators, and taxpayers. With that, I yield to the ranking member, Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Owens, and good morning. Thank you so much to our witnesses. Welcome today. Thank you for your time and looking forward to your testimony. Investing in workforce development is a critical step we must take to ensure a brighter future for our economy. With today's hearing, we're taking a step in the right direction to support both workers and employers <clears throat> alike. The need for this investment is more urgent than ever, not because our economy is struggling, but because it is thriving. The reality is that the unemployment rate is still near record lows and wages are increasing. This is a direct result of key legislation we delivered last Congress. These legislative victories are creating millions of good paying jobs. Combined with President Biden's work to build the economy, 
from the bottom up and middle out. We have created on average 470,000 jobs every month since the start of this administration. For workers to benefit from this historic job growth, they need the skills and credentials to succeed in new careers. And for employers to benefit, they need access to a dedicated and skilled workforce. There is no better tool to meet both of those needs and connect people with quality jobs than the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. <clears throat> WIOA is the backbone of our workforce system, but our investment in workforce development falls short of where it needs to be to stay competitive in the global economy. Other developed countries spend half to 1% at their gross domestic product on workforce development. We in America spend only one-tenth of one percent. We cannot afford to fall behind in this critical area, and increasing our investment is the only way to stay competitive. That is why last Congress committee Democrats led a series of bipartisan hearings to craft the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2022, which was designed to enhance WIOA funding, expand access for underserved communities, and ensure that workers are connected to high quality jobs. The House passed the bill last year with four Republican votes. I believe my Republican colleagues agree that we must strengthen skills development. Yet, just last month, House Republicans passed a debt ceiling proposal that takes us backwards. By cutting workforce funding, the Default on America Act would prevent roughly 750,000 job seekers from accessing services and skills programs. This is the wrong approach. So today's hearing can help us correct course and build on last Congress's progress towards a bipartisan WIOA reauthorization. There are two fundamental goals a meaningful reauthorization, reauthorization must achieve. Expanding a job seeker's access to workforce programs and meeting the needs of businesses. Far more workers could benefit from skills development programs and enter higher quality jobs if we finally put serious money behind WIOA. In fact, the WIOA of 2022 included 80 billion over six years to help train more than a million workers each year. Importantly, more jobs, many job seekers need additional support with childcare, transportation, housing, to complete skills programs. Take, for example, job seekers with children. If they don't have childcare, they won't be able to attend classes or go into work for on-the-job training. It's time to stop putting up barriers and start breaking barriers down. By investing in critical support services, we can empower job seekers to achieve their full potential and succeed in the workforce. We must also ensure that skills programs and support are accessible to those who need them most, but currently have the least access. Workers of color, young people, workers who have been forced out of their jobs, and just as involved individuals. For example, I led the Strengthening Job Corps Act of 2022 last Congress to ensure that the Job Corps programs utilizes work-based learning to get young people into good jobs. Skills programs and support must be accessible to those who have the least access. Young people, displaced workers, these 
groups face significant barriers to education and training programs, limiting their jobs opportunities and hindering their success to the workforce. For our workforce system to truly succeed, it needs to be a win-win for both job seekers and employers. Without adequate funding, we owe our programs for employers are being utilized by just 8% of employers. That has to change. But currently, we owe our programs are only used by a measly 8% of employers due to insufficient funding. It's time for a change. Uh, we authorization of we all that prior prioritizes unemployment-based training and sector partnerships can help businesses find the skilled workers they need and boast local economies with higher paying jobs. The bottom line is that an effective reauthorization must put access first. Quality and innovation also that meets the needs of workers and businesses. Today, I look forward to charting a path forward that achieves these priorities and prepares workers and businesses for success. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Wilson. Pursuant to community, community rule, Committee Rule 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m., 14 days after the date of this hearing, which is May 25th, 2023. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open 14 days to allow the, such statements and, and other extra, uh, extraneous uh, material reference uh, during the hearing to be submitted for the uh, official hearing record. I will now turn to an introduction to our distinguished witnesses. The first witness is Ms. Linda Logan, who is Vice President for Global Education and Workforce Development for, at IBM. Our second witness is Bruce Ferguson, who is CEO of Career Source Northeast Florida. The third witness is Dr. Harry Holzer, who is a professor of public policy at Georgetown University. And my, our fourth witness is John Palash, who is founder and CEO at One Workforce Solutions, located in Aiken, South Carolina. I want to thank all witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to co community rules, I would ask that you each limit your oral presentation to five minutes, five minute a summary in your written statement. I would also like to remind the witnesses to be aware of their responsibilities to provide accurate information to the subcommittee. I first recognize Ms. Linda Logan. Good morning, Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Lydia Logan, IBM's Vice President for Global Education and Workforce Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the state of skills development in the United States. In my role at IBM, I create effective education and workforce programs by leading our community and university skills initiatives. Today, I will share IBM's experience leading skills development programs, talk about the need for multiple pathways to careers, and to offer policy recommendations that can scale proven efforts. As a global technology leader, IBM believes the US must rethink its education and workforce development approach to meet today's market needs and create good paying jobs. To help close the skills gap, we offer a range of education and career readiness programs at no cost. To broaden and diversify our talent pool, IBM removed the four-year degree requirement for 50% of our US job postings. That resulted in a more diverse applicant pool and almost 20% of our US hires joining without a degree. The IBM Apprenticeship Program is another way we're creating pathways to meaningful careers in technology. We started our first of its kind technology apprenticeship in 2017. And today we have over 30 different apprenticeship job roles from cybersecurity to AI to digital design. IBM's apprenticeship programs are recognized for up to 40 college credits or about 80% of an associate's degree. 
This is all at no cost for the participants and allows them to pursue a career and college education at the same time. We are working with community colleges to transfer these credits and add complementary courses that would lead to an associate's degree for participants who wish to do so. As part of our co commitment to skill 30 million people worldwide by 2030, we offer the cost-free IBM Skills Build program to high school and university students, educators, and adult learners. This helps participants develop valuable tech and workplace skills and access to career opportunities through customized practical learning experiences. The platform offers over 1,000 courses in up to 20 languages with the opportunity to earn digital credentials recognized by industry. We work with partners like the Department of Veterans Affairs to offer IBM Skills Build for service members and veterans to pursue in-demand technology roles. The online version is open to anyone and is flexible in meeting individual learning needs for place, pace, and path. As this panel and employers know, our nation's education workforce systems are not equipped to meet the market demands of the modern digital economy, and there is no silver bullet to fix that. Instead, we suggest employers, policymakers, education providers, and other stakeholders act collectively to make the most significant impact to help current and future workers. We offer the following policy recommendations. First, align higher education workforce development laws to focus on skills. It's critical our federal higher education workforce laws work together to provide the necessary resources to attain in-demand skills. Second, dedicate individual training accounts for workforce development. IBM recommends that Congress remove barriers that lim limit skills attainment within WIOA, including dedicating funding towards ITAs, increasing dollar limits on incumbent worker programs, and enhancing work-based learning programs. Third, reform the eligible training provider list. We need to directly connect the list to employers with in-demand and growing jobs. Fourth, transparency and outcomes. Job seekers need, to com need complete information on program measures such as completion and employment rates, credential attainment, and earnings. To do this, they need to better access quality data. We also believe Congress can encourage the development and coordination of an open, interoperable data infrastructure with strong privacy and security measures so that job seekers, employers, and education providers can better align and share digital credentials. In conclusion, we know these updates can be made in a way that unlocks opportunities for all Americans, but it's going to require industry, government, education institutions, and other community stakeholders to shift the way we approach education, skills development, and hiring. Thank you again for the opportunity to share IBM's experience and recommendations with the committee. Thank you, Ms. Logan. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to next rec recognize Mr. Bruce Ferguson. Thank you, Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Bruce Ferguson, and I serve as the CEO of Career Source Northeast Florida, the regional workforce board serving the Jacksonville region. As Congress considers reauthorizing WIOA, I'd like to address the importance of work based learning as a tool to upskill our nation's workforce, as well as the importance of regulatory flexibility and the reduction of administrative waste. Some 25 years ago, our Board of Directors made a key decision that put the skills needs of our business community at the center of our strategies. Since then, our team of professionals has worked to understand and respond to the needs of our companies. We have developed essential partnerships with our regional economic development organization, the Jacks USA Partnership, the economic development councils in each of our counties, and industry associations. These relationships enhance our understanding of the regional economy and focus our resources on targeted industries such as advanced manufacturing, logistics, and healthcare. We are experiencing one of the tightest labor markets in history, and employers are having a hard time finding the skilled workers they need. This creates an opportunity to enhance our region's focus on work based learning. Businesses are seeking ways to upskill their workforce and increase productivity. Tools such as customized training and apprenticeships act as catalysts for companies to build their own workforce pipeline 
and create career pathways for their employees. The key to getting companies to use WIOA services is to keep it simple. We assist interested employers in completing a simple eight-page grant application. Once approved, the rest of the agreement is only a few additional pages. We also employ an apprenticeship navigator who assists companies in the development of apprenticeship programs. Too often, our system and regulatory bodies turn what should be a simple and concise application and agreement into an overly complex process, resulting in employers turning away from our services. Businesses know best what skills their employees need to succeed, and they need access to skill building programs that are easy to use. A couple of our success stories are with Grace Aerospace and Flagler Health. Grace Aerospace is a small manufacturer providing full service electrical and structural manufacturing for the U.S. military and commercial clients. With WIOA funding assistance, a Grace quality manager became a certified Institute for Printed Circuits IPC trainer. The company has since leveraged that manager's new certification to upskill seven additional Grace employees. They are all now certified IPC specialists and received a minimum pay increase of 10%. This new workforce skill set also enabled Grace Aerospace to grow in new market segments, performing electrical work for the Department of Energy and NASA, both of which require certified IPC techs to perform the manufacturing process. Flagler Health faced a shortage of surgical technologists and reached out to us for assistance. We help them navigate the apprenticeship development and approval process through the Florida Department of Education. The result is a 12-month apprenticeship, and all apprentices were already employed in other areas of the hospitals and were looking for new career opportunities. They only needed a high school diploma or GED to be considered. Surgical tech apprentices start at $15 an hour with full benefits, and after program completion, they make over $19 an hour a 28% salary increase. These are examples of how our focus on WIOA customized training and apprenticeships is positively impacting our region's workforce and businesses. We believe enhancing current WIOA legislation to be even more integrated and flexible can really be a difference maker. With the current flexibility, our board has been able to shape policies and skill building programs that meet local business needs. Our philosophy is that if the law and the rules don't say we can't do something, then it must mean we can. However, additional explicit flexibility is encouraged to counter those who tend to operate with the opposite philosophy of if it doesn't say we can, then we can't. Also, there is still a tremendous amount of administrative waste in the process of separately tracking multiple funding silos, eligibility processes, and data entry. While we strive to streamline our services for business and job seekers, the multiple programs we work with make streamlining more difficult. We are forced to use systems that require extensive data collection and reporting to the state and federal level. The job seeker and business customer experience take a backseat to reporting requirements. This approach is backwards and needs to be addressed as part of reauthorization. Chairman Owens, that concludes my remarks. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, I will now recognize uh, Dr. Harry Holzer. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, uh, and distinguished subcommittee members, uh, I'd like to make four main points in my testimony this morning. Uh, number one, many millions of Americans without any post-secondary education or training credentials would have higher productivity and higher earnings uh, if they received more training. And many million vacant skilled jobs would be able to be more easily filled. Uh, remember that in America today, almost half of all Americans have no post-secondary education or training credential, and too many of them are employed in very low-wage jobs, often low-wage service jobs, and particularly people of color are very heavily concentrated there. All the numbers are in my written testimony. Uh, they, could, they could receive uh, better training and do better. Number two, relative to American skill needs, relative to almost all other industrial countries, and even relative to earlier decades in the United States, our levels of public spending on workforce training are extremely low. For instance, we now spend only about $4 billion a year on the core programs in Titles I and II of WIOA. Total spending in those titles is about $6 billion. Now, in a $25 trillion economy, 
and one with 150 million workers, that constitutes very, very low investment. Now, GAO, the General Accountability Office, tells us we have a lot more uh, programs, federal programs besides WIOA. If you add all those up, it comes out to be in the ballpark of 20 billion. That may sound like a lot, but it remains less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of GDP, which is vastly lower as a percent of GDP than almost all other industrial countries spend on what they call active labor market programs. And in the United States, it's declined over time. In 1980, the Department of Labor was spending an amount that in current dollars would be $60 billion a year. And now it's 20. It has declined by two thirds in a time period when the labor force has grown by 50% and skill needs have risen. We are under investing. Point number three, the impacts of the training we do on participant productivity and participant earnings are dramatically limited by these very low funding levels. Total of all the dollars being spent, only about a half a billion dollars right now are being spent on actual training for about 220,000 people per year. And each one gets a little over $2,000 on average. Compare that to the Pell program. Pell grants provide almost $7,000 per year at this point and serve 6 million people. There's a great imbalance. Now, how effective is that training? Because at the end of the day, we want to make cost-effective investments. Uh, the research evidence is somewhat mixed, but the most plausible studies suggest that the impacts eventually reach $1,500 to $2,000 in the adult program. That's, that's the annual bump up uh, generated by this training. Uh, the numbers for the displaced worker program are somewhat smaller. Um, and that's a pretty, if, if those impacts last, if they don't fade out over time, that's a quite strong economic return on investment. Of course, the core, and especially the intensive services people receive at the American Job Centers uh, are also cost effective. They are much, much less expensive, and those small dollars are generating quite strong returns. But of course, there's other versions of training uh, besides these programs take certificate programs at community college. On average, they generate nice returns. They vary across the programs. But on average, the larger the investment, the larger the earnings gain. Short-term programs generate impacts, but less than long-term, et cetera. And the very best programs, the sector-based programs, Perscolis, Project Quest, Year Up, generate over $5,000 per worker with, that doesn't fade out over time, but they cost about $10,000 per worker. And then my fourth point, besides just increasing funding for training, I would put the additional priorities on the table as follows. Number one, we need to expand dedicated additional not dollars for highly effective sectoral training mode programs of, of the kinds already discussed today, uh, as well as research and evaluation for what makes them good. Uh, right now, we mandate that local boards create these partnerships, but there's no funding or technical assistance to support that. Number two, I support more funding for apprenticeship and for work-based learning and incumbent worker training to support very good state innovations going on. Number three, we need to fund career guidance and service support services more fully. And number four, we need much better data than we have right now. Data on WIOA outcomes, uh, the employer training provider lists are a bit of a mess. They do need to be reformed, as has been said. Other data on labor market trends, there's various state initiatives, credential engine, all of these are making progress. So uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holzer. Uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. John Polesh. Thank you. Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is John Palish, and most recently I ran the Employment and Training Administration at the Department of Labor, so the federal agency responsible for administering the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And prior to that, I ran the State Workforce Agency for the state of Kentucky, so uh, the state agency that administers WIOA at the state level. It's an honor to discuss a topic vital to America's continued growth and prosperity, building and sustaining a skilled workforce. To my appearance today, I'd like to highlight three areas where I respectfully believe Congress could further its mission to increase opportunities, enhance accountability, and improve outcomes across the public workforce system. First, we must acknowledge and incentivize state and local boards to overcome perceived and real challenges to innovation. Second, 
We should hold the U.S. Department of Labor, state workforce agencies, and local boards accountable for their poor performance across a multitude of workforce programs. And third, Congress should explore targeted clarification and changes to WIOA to ensure skills development in the system aligns with the needs of employers. My written testimony explains in greater detail the challenges, performance failures, and areas for improvement in our public workforce system. But my oral statement will argue significant underperformance and failures at multiple layers of our workforce system are jointly the fault of local, state, and federal partners. Local, because the infrastructure as it exists is present at the local level with more than 550 local workforce boards operating more than 2,400 American job centers across the country. In addition, a majority of the WIOA funds pass through the state and land with the local boards as subgrantees, and with it the accountability and responsibility to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. States share responsibility because the governor and state boards set the strategic direction for the state and have a critical role in negotiating levels of performance, maintaining the list of eligible training providers, and fostering alignment across workforce programs. To date, no state, not even Utah, which has the strongest statewide integration of workforce programs, has fully achieved the promise of WIOA. At the federal level, the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration must reorganize to simultaneously be more aligned with state workforce agencies as states explore integration and innovation, while also holding states and other grantees more accountable to delivering positive outcomes for the billions of dollars awarded annually through formula and discretionary grants. Finally, Congress must provide more rigorous oversight to ensure that DOL is performing its critical role in skills development. Congress has a unique role here, and today's hearings demonstrates your willingness to press for improved performance and accountability. Having said that, I agree with Ms. Logan. We must resist the urge to look for the silver bullet to address our nation's workforce challenges. Almost never are complex problems resolved by pulling a single lever, utilizing a particular flexibility, or holding a particular hearing. Rather, we must look across the broader workforce system and understand how poor leadership, outdated technology, incomplete data, and a disjointed patchwork of federal workforce programs allows too many in the system to do what they have always done which for decades employers have told us is simply not enough. As currently constituted, too much of our workforce funding goes to cover overhead and an obsolete brick and mortar delivery system. Couple that with a train and prey model where incomplete and outdated labor market information pair with the lack of reliable performance data for most eligible providers to prevent a greater emphasis on job attached or employer driven skills development. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the ETPL which contains more than 75,000 WIOA eligible skills development programs across the country with little to no repercussion for poor outcomes. We know this because the WIOA data tells us that only 34.6% of WIOA adults who receive WIOA skills development are placed in a job related to that skills development. That percentage drops to 34.2% for dislocated workers and drops all the way to 20.8% for youth. So one in five youth who receive skills development under WIOA find a job related to that skills development. Finally, most local boards, and I do not include Northeast Florida in this group, fail to maximize job attached skills development flexibilities that currently exist in WIOA, such as customized training, incumbent worker training, on the job training, and apprenticeship programs. For their part, Governors and state workforce agencies often don't see high enough standards for performance and rarely hold local boards accountable. In addition, the states conduct insufficient oversight of their state's ETPL and often fail to exercise existing staffing flexibilities designed to aid in program coordination. My old employer, the Department of Labor, must also be more aggressive to foster a workforce system welcoming and inviting of innovation and creativity to address the lack of skilled workers produced by the system. As currently constituted, the Department of Labor lacks adequate talent, technology, structure, and appropriate resource allocation to provide both assistance and accountability to grantees. In closing, I welcome the opportunity to provide te technical assistance to Congress on this legislative issues. Thank you for your commitment to building a stronger workforce system by listening to the needs of job creators, delivering upon upskilling opportunities to workers, and holding skills education programs accountable for their performance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pulash, appreciate that. Under Committee Rule 9, we'll now begin questioning witnesses under the five-minute rule. I'll begin the process. Uh, Ms. Linda Logan, um, you gave us an example of how IBM has used the work-based learning 
to address so, uh, shortage of skilled workers and supply, uh, support career uh, advancement. What updates to a war would be needed uh, to make employer-led uh, programs a greater force, a greater focus in this, in this particular law? So, yes, thank you for that question, Chairman Owens. We believe that there are a variety of programs that are needed to really address the skills gaps that we see. IBM is addressing them in multiple ways. We both have apprenticeship programs and we have the free skilling programs that we offer, like Skills Build. We work with workforce boards and with partner organizations so that people who need opportunities can access the skill development that's appropriate for them where they are. I think the flexibility that WIOA can offer for local programming at high quality aligned to job needs is what we need to focus on. How do we make sure that we're aligning what employers need with the skills that are offered in a measurable, in a measurable way? Very good. Thank you so much. Uh So, sorry, uh, Ms. Ms. Ferguson, having the business uh, sector contribute to the cost of skill development programs is a critical way to maximize the impact of taxpayer dollars. Uh, how does uh, the cost effectiveness of WIOA customized training compare to those others, uh, other skill development programs? Right, so for us, Mr. Chairman, uh, on the customized training piece, the employer has to contribute at least 50% of the cost of the training. Quite often it is uh, more than that. Uh, for this current program year that we're in, I can tell you that our average uh, individual training account, single scholarship, is costing us about $6,300 per participant. And our average cost per participant for the customized training is just over $1,400. So it's about a four and a half four and a half times more efficient on the customized side. Very good, thank you so much. Mr. Polesh, uh, we, uh, we have nearly 10 million unfilled jobs, a, um, unfilled jobs, a, a severe skill shortage, and too many Americans on the sideline and out of work, yet the DOL consider, considers the public workforce system in every single state a performance success. Why is that? And uh, what changes the way our accountability structure are needed to tackle the workforce issues facing our nation? Yes, thank you for your question. So there's, I think there's two things we need to focus on. One is the particular measures within the WIOA law. Um, if we take a look at what states are measured against, there are six common measures. Uh, but if we drill down on what those measures are, for example, two of the measures are, was the individual employed during the second quarter after they exited the program? And were they employed during the fourth quarter after they exited the program? It doesn't ask if they were employed for the entire quarter, nor does it ask if the, the employment in the second quarter was the same as the employment in the fourth quarter. Mm. So I could have two jobs during the year, one day in the second quarter and one day in the fourth quarter, and the state is able to claim me as a plus one in both of those. Mm -hmm. So we really have to take a look at the measures that we're holding states accountable to. But then we also have to look at the negotiated levels of performance. And I, I, I took... I pulled down from the department's website the 2023 negotiated performance levels for some of the states. And if you look at the, the performance levels, and, and I hate to pick on states, but we're gonna have to do that. If I look at New York and New Jersey, their second quarter after exit, so the number of people they say during the second quarter after they exit the program are gonna have a job, is 61% for New York and 62% for New Jersey. So those states are telling us right off the bat, 40% of the people who exit our program are gonna be unemployed for six months. They're telling us that right off the bat. That's their negotiated level of performance. If we look at the fourth quarter after exit, we can pick on a state like Vermont, where it's 60.5. So again, trending down. Another measure is the, the median wages. How many wages does an individual make in a quarter? Again, if we look at the negotiated performance levels, New Jersey, their negotiated performance level for the adult program under WIOA is $5,400 a quarter. So that's $20,000 a year. That's the bar that they want to hold themselves accountable to. We are, going to, we are going to provide skills development to people, and we hope they will make $20,000 a year when they leave our program. That's just not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to do better. So it, it's strengthening the performance measures, and then it's making sure we hold, hold the states to higher performance targets. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, I now recognize the ranking member. Um, Scott? Oh. I recommend uh, uh, Ms. Scott. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Um, 
Mr. Holzer, um, there was a study that showed, and I think you kind of referred to this by giving two numbers, that only about 22 percent of the money spent on the um, local boards is spent on actual training services. Uh, what's the rest of the money spent on? The rest of the money is spent on a range of other services uh, offered, and of course the staff, uh, the data needed to support those efforts. But a lot of other money is spent on core services, intensive services uh, at one-stop shops. The evidence, the rigorous evidence suggests that those are effective, very cost-effective investments, uh, and we should be making more of them. The, the whole pot needs to be bigger so that this effective investment isn't competing with this one. Thank you. And when you mentioned 50 percent of, of the public has no post-secondary education, when one of that group shows up at the Workforce Council looking for a job, where do they actually get the training? Well, ideally they go to, to the one stop, the American Job Centers we now call them, and ideally they get some guidance as to where they can get training. And, and they'll, they'll be referred to somebody on the eligible uh, training list? Uh, that's they, correct. And you mentioned the typical costs of 1000 to $10,000? Um, on average, they're a little over $2,000, uh, and unfortunately, that is just vastly less money than is often needed for a really good training program. Again, compared to well, Pell I mean, the, Grants, the, the much the, co the cost of the program, then, is, is up to $10,000, I think you mentioned. Um, I don't think I mentioned that number. Oh, uh, the very best sector-based programs, Prescolis, Project Quest, year up, which have very good relationships with private employers, those, the very best programs do cost about $10,000 a year. Okay. That's now, correct. Now, we've all seen studies that show that a lot of families can't come up with a couple of hundred dollars. <clears throat> How do people without a job looking for a job come up with the cost of these training programs? Um, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for them to do so. Uh, the amount of money, again, in these ITAs is too small. Now, if these folks if these folks are eligible for a Pell Grant, then that provides you know, almost $7,000 a year. That's good money, but remember, currently, there's great restrictions on that, uh, on Pell Grants. It has to be a relatively long certificate program. It has to be for credit, and that's why passing some version of short-term Pell uh, is important with the appropriate uh, guardrails. And I think you have um, really struck at the heart of the problem. How do you guarantee that if we were to pass short-term Pell, that it would only be available for quality programs. That, that's, you don't have to answer that. That's what we're working on uh, right now. I, I would briefly to answer that. I think to do this correctly, you need the right data. You need the right earnings data that follows people over time and compares them to people who are not in the programs. And I respectfully disagree with my colleague, Mr. Palish. Uh, I read those data completely differently than he does. You can't just look at earnings levels, you got to look at the improvements over time that those generated. If a person's starting at a very, very low earnings level <clears throat> and get a 10 or 20 percent bump up, I would consider that a successful program. So with the right data, we could do a good job of having guardrails. Can you say, a, you mentioned um, apprenticeships very briefly. Why are they such a good deal? Um, apprenticeships uh, seem to be effective because they are targeted for the individual employer. They are customized in some sense. The employers are training people for exactly the skills they need. Um, uh, and, and, and when that fits, when the worker's needs fit with the employer's needs, that generates a good return. Having said that, we also want to make sure that the training isn't too narrow. If we're investing public money in these workers, we want to make sure that at least some of those skills are portable beyond just the individual in question, but I, but I think apprenticeship does seem to pass that mark. I don't think the earnings gains fade out. And youth employment opportunities, particularly for disconnected youth, that's those not in school and not working, why are those investments important? Um, very simply, uh, this is primarily out of school youth. There is, there are some, a lot of good programs for in school youth, for career and technical education and, and in some community colleges, but for out of school youth, uh, very often with not great, often no post-secondary training whatsoever, uh, they need more. They need more help. Their current level of skills simply doesn't enable them 
to try to get good jobs, and, and often they, they even lack the knowledge of where good jobs are, what employers are looking for, where they can enhance their skills, et cetera. So there's a big job to do there. And Ms. Logan, in, in your testimony, we don't have time for, for an answer, but I'm going to pose a question to you. You, you um, suggested reforms in the eligible training provider list. Um, obviously, we, we want to separate the good from the bad. If you could provide your suggestions, that would be very helpful. Thank you, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to now recommend, uh, rec uh, recognize Mr. Goffman. Goffman. Yeah, Ms. Logan, we'll start with you. Uh, given the current worker shortage and skills gap, we cannot afford to spend taxpayer dollars on workforce <laughs> programs that aren't effective. How do we get better data on program outcomes, such as completion and employment rates, and help steer funding to higher quality programs? Some of this needs to be required of the providers on the eligible provider list. We need to, as the, our panelists have said, make sure that data is publicly available. People who are seeking out skilling need to know that the program they are going to participate in is going to yield the result that they need, that they'll be able to be placed in a job that will give them a living wage. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Palish, we got that right. In your opinion, what are the key factors that contribute to successful workforce development programs, and how can these be uh, integrated into the, a successful WIOA system? So I think it starts with leadership uh, at the state level. It starts with integration of programs across the state level so that when we realize we've got many funding streams from the federal government coming into a state, the ability for a state to coordinate that funding, the ability for the state to make sure that they are leveraging the funding for, for, the, for its targeted intent. Uh, and then it's, it's really getting back to performance. It's getting back to what we are holding ourselves accountable to. We've talked a lot about the ETPL list today. Uh, there are a couple of states out there who have more training programs on their ETPL than people they train. So right there we know we have too many programs. So a lot, of, a lot of the responsibility falls to the governors and to the leadership at the state level to make sure that the local workforce boards are targeting that skills development. More, more programs than people who are in the programs. Correct. More training programs, correct. Uh, um, how many of those are what you'd call primarily federally funded and how many are primarily state funded? So being on the eligible training provider list makes you eligible for WIOA funding. So as, as Bruce was talking about, the individual training account or the ITA, when I, when I go to an American Job Center and I present myself and I say, I need some, I need some upskilling, I want to, I want to get some skills development, I, in essence, I'm, I'm able to pick from the eligible training provider list. The career coaches are supposed to help me narrow down that choice so that it's really informed customer choice. But by being on the ETPL, all of those are eligible for WIOA funding. What would happen if the federal government got out of this and just the state, state had to uh, determine who they were going to train on their own? And, and would the state be paying in that instance on their own? Well, I would suppose that most states want adequate job training. I mean, we in Wisconsin have a tremendous technical college system. The state and local pays for it. What do we get for having the federal government involved in it as well? So I, I think we can have both. As, as I mentioned, I think there's responsibility at all three What, what would happen if the feds got out of it? What do they add to the mix? Traditionally, what they add is funding. They add infrastructure. They add the partnerships, the ability to, to leverage, like I said, across programs, so that there are, there are advantages to having the federal government part, as a partner in this. Wouldn't the state pick up some of the funding? Well, uh, Mr. Ferguson, as we look to increase access to work-based learning opportunities, some have raised concerns about the regulatory burden and administrative waste associated with the old workforce boards. How can we streamline these processes to reduce waste and increase efficiency while maintaining accountability and oversight? And do you feel that it's accurate that there's uh, regulatory burden and administrative waste associated with WIOA? Well, in our experience uh, in Florida in particular, not only under our umbrella do we have the WIOA funding, we also have the workforce piece of TANF, of the SNAP employment and training, veteran services, et cetera. So there are a, a multitude of federal funding programs that operate under our umbrella, and 
that makes it difficult. I have to train staff across multiple programs in addition to WIOA to get the job done. And we work with multiple systems. Okay. Lots eligibility. of programs. Isn't, isn't that by itself a sign we got problems with lots of different programs? You look here and there. Wouldn't the state be a little bit more nimble and be able to handle this stuff without the feds mucking around? Well, certainly we appreciate the, the funding level and the effort that does come in from the federal level to make this work. I know we have a lot of extra federal money. I know, but go ahead, go ahead. But to have it more simplified under one program would certainly be beneficial. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize Ms. Wilson. So excited. Thank you, Chair Owens. My mantra has always been jobs, jobs, jobs. When we talk about WIOA, I think about how this federal investment in work force development changes lives, gives hope, and propels our constituents to greater heights and prosperity. While this hearing is focused on adult job training services, I would be remiss if I did not highlight the need for a hearing focused on youth workforce investments in Title I of WIOA, which supports job training programs and services for unemployed and underemployed individuals. We need to make a substantial investment in dropouts and those we consider out of school youth. That investment can play a crucial role in, dismant in dismantling the school to prison pipeline and reducing crime in our communities. With that, I have a few questions. Dr. Holzer, you mentioned in your testimony that inclusion of scale sectoral training programs is vital in any WIOA reauthorization. The WIOA of 2022 expanded the sectoral training programs requiring local boards to allocate a billion dollars a year through formula grants. Can you explain the reasons behind the success of this approach to training and is it necessary to ensure that local boards have sufficient funding to implement an evidence-based approach. Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Ms. Wilson. Um, sectoral appro approaches work for similar reasons to why apprenticeship works. Uh, there's a dual customer focus where we are making sure that the training dollars are going to employers who have good jobs uh, as well as workers to get the right skills to meet those needs. And you usually need a skilled intermediary who knows the industry, a, a Perscolis, a Project Quest, uh, et cetera, to bring the two sides together and, and make sure that, that this, the training is effective. Uh, it also requires support services. Uh, and all of those successful programs provide support services uh, career guidance, job search assistance, child care and transportation, et cetera. And you simply can't do that on the cheap. And that's why the very best programs do, in fact, need approximately $10,000 per participant in order to put all of the pieces in place to make these efforts successful. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson, it's always great having another Floridian in the room. And as the CEO of Career Source Northeast Florida, you have ex experienced that with the state system, which is relevant to my work with Career Source Broward and Career Source South Florida in my district. I've worked with Mr. Rick Beasley for years. As you shared in your testimony, a good customized training program requires buy-in from the two key partners, the board and the employer. In your case, it seems employers are instrumental in the success of your programming. Unfortunately, the customized training program is an underutilized program for other local boards. How can we not only encourage more employers to participate in the program, but also get buy-in from those employers? So I was really surprised at how underutilized customized training is across the country as I saw some of the, the data about that. It was, I wasn't surprised, I was actually shocked. We find it to be a highly effective program, both for the companies. The Grace Aerospace is a double win because the employees got new skills, new certifications, and additional dollars in their pocket. 
and it opened new markets for the business so that business can grow and hire more workers as they go along. So for us, it's become second nature. It's really critical for our workforce boards to have really deep partnerships with the economic development organizations in their particular workforce areas. That is a huge benefit for us to understand what sectors our economic developers are targeting in terms of the best areas for growth. And because we do have limited funds, we try to target both our ITA funding as well as customized training in those targeted industries. Um, it's, I, you know, I say it's not rocket science, but apparently it's, a, it's less, uh, less used than it should be. It's a competitive advantage for our region, I'll just say that. I yield back. Thank you. I now, you. I'll now recognize Ms. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you each for your testimony today and your uh, participation in this hearing. Uh, Mr. Palish, I want to start with you. You mentioned earlier, uh, just a few minutes ago, in response to Mr. Grothman's questions about the need for additional accountability. And I just wonder if you could give me some examples about the types of accountability that you believe should be a part of the WIOA program as we move forward to ensure that every dollar is used appropriately. Thank you for your question. Um, accountability starts with the sanctions provision in the law. Um, unfortunately, uh, there was no subregulatory guidance from the Department of Labor on how to administer sanctions uh, until February of 2020. Uh, and it just so happened that I signed that subregulatory guidance. So for more than five years, the law was in place without the Department of Labor weighing in on exactly how the department would hold the states accountable and how the states would hold the local workforce boards accountable. So we can see that there wasn't a real commitment to accountability. There wasn't a real commitment to sanctions up front. So I think if, if we can get the Department of Labor to focus on its responsibility, if we can get the states to focus on their responsibilities, we all have a role here uh, and we all have to do a little bit better at our job. We all have to do a little bit better about holding everybody accountable, making sure that the ETPL is clean, making sure we have tight relationships with employers. Um, and and to, to Mr. Holzer's comment earlier, in my written testimony, I said that I, I don't think wages are a good measure. And, and within the PEARL, which is a very massive file that the, the states are required to submit for every individual they serve, we collect their pre pre-enrollment wages and their post-enrollment wages. So we can absolutely look at the difference in wages, the change in wages, but we don't do it. That's not the measure. The measure we're held to is just what are your wages. So that there's things that we could do to, to tighten this up, to really focus on what we all want, which is positive outcomes for job seekers. Each of you, and I, and I agree with that, thank you for that response. Each of you has been involved in workforce development for a number of years. I'm curious if we could just go down the panel and I'd like for each of you to give me a, a quick response on programs, you don't have to identify them by name, but programs that have not worked. Help me understand and help the committee understand why they're not working and what traps we need to avoid as we begin to reshape we OA this next year. Ma'am, I'd like to start with you, Ms. Logan. Um, I think what we need to focus on are programs that are connected to jobs that are local so that people see the relevance of what they're learning connected to what's actually going to where they will be employed afterwards so job connected learning yes and that was going to be one of my next <laughs> questions but since you brought it up i'm curious what would you suggest we do to make sure the businesses are connected to that workforce development because that in fact is the goal right absolutely uh, well first certainly involvement with workforce boards i'd also say the economic development locally always is driven by by business and the jobs that are going to be created locally is a way to make sure that the skills that are needed by the jobs that will be created need to be aligned to the training, the skilling programs that are being offered. Mr. Ferguson, back to my first question about programs that you've seen that have not worked. Where has been the bottleneck or what has been the problem? Gosh, what doesn't work? We try to make it all work as best we can, um, but the, some of the difficulty lies in the data collection that we have to go through for a participant in WIOA to do a full WIOA application for us may take up to 45 minutes through the state system. Uh, that's too long. We need to be able to collect what we need and move a participant through the process in a quick manner. 
I'm shocked that you would say a federal program has too many documents and strings attached to it to make it difficult. And unfortunately, that's that's the case. I think that is true. Uh, sir, next, I'd like to just move to you. Answer my question, if you don't mind. What, what have you seen that doesn't work that we need to avoid? Um, I, I can't name individual or single out individual programs. I would argue that in some cases, in certain limited cases, the training either may not be appropriate or portable uh, for the workers who leave that sector, or, or in fact, the, the wages on those jobs might be extremely low. Uh, as, and, and, and with training, individuals could do better than that. I think, again, with the right data, we could weed out ineffective programs, uh, get them off the ETPL lists. Uh, but, but, but again, the quality of the jobs for which we are training, and, and let's be honest, the dollars are so small that they can't use them to train for really good jobs because the dollars are too limited. And I'm almost out of time, so I think what I heard you guys say is some, a lot of the problems are there's no portability sometimes, there's no uh, basis and outcomes, there's no accountability, there's too much regulation, uh, an oversight by the federal government, and frankly, not enough creativity in allowing lo local workforce boards to do what is best in their local community. Is that an accurate summary? All right, thank you guys. Appreciate your time, I yield back. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now recognize Ms. Manning. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I represent a district where we've had huge job losses when many of our textile and furniture manufacturing manu facilities moved overseas. And after many, many years of effort, we have been successful in attracting new advanced manufacturing jobs, but those jobs <clears throat> require more skills than many of our workers have. Uh, those skills require programs from apprenticeships to training programs to community college, and of course, all these programs cost money. Dr. Holzer, you mentioned in your testimony that compared to other developed countries, we are dramatically under-investing in, in training our workforce. And you cited reports that show that greater investment in worker training results in higher income to those workers, which I assume leads to more self-sufficiency. So how much should we be investing in our workers um, I, don't, I don't think there's any magic number or magic level. What I know for sure is that less than one-tenth of one percent of GDP is dramatically too small. So if we were more like some of the more successful countries in the EU, where as a percentage of GDP, they will spend four-tenths of a percent, five-tenths of a percent, I, I think by those standards that would put us uh, in a better place, again, even in 1980 as a percent of GDP, we're, we were spending dramatically more than we are today. So I can't give an exact number, but it would be substantially higher. We're spending a half a billion dollars of we owe money on training. It's, it's crazy to think that that's sufficient for what a $25 trillion economy with 150 million workers needs. And what other kinds of efforts can be made <clears throat> to attract people to seek out these skills uh, programs? How can we remove hurdles uh, to participation? Um, I, I think that starts simply with, with getting the word out uh, in the community, in schools, in community colleges about local opportunities within the region, about vacant jobs, the skills they require. Now, not every form of training is going to work for every unemployed worker or every low-skilled worker. Right? There's a certain basic level of skill needs, which is why basic literacy needs, including digital literacy, are also important. But I think getting the word out, combining, I think, brick and mortar American job centers still have a role to play, but, but also uh, um, digital forms. Uh, a lot of people do need, need some human touch to help that process, but strong outreach, uh, making information on opportunities available that meet what individual workers as well as individual employers can bring together uh, is the goal. And are there other federal programs that provide support services like food assistance and child care and transportation that could also allow people to seek out these kinds of training programs that might, they might not be able to, to uh, pursue right now? Um, yes, out, out of the 43 programs that GAO identifies, some of them do uh, allow spending on, on child care, transportation, and, and, and career guidance and job seeking guidance is, is very important. And of course, we owe money is spent on, on those things as well. There's simply too few dollars to provide all of those needs 
uh, all from this very small pot. And at what age should we be talking to young people about the kinds of skilled jobs that are out there and the kinds of training that they might need? Should we be approaching them earlier in high school? Should we be approaching them in middle school? Are we talking to kids too late about what might be out there? Uh, I believe we are talking to them too late. I mean, we tell, we tell kids in the seventh grade, you need to take algebra. We don't tell them why. A lot of those seventh graders may not be highly motivated to take those classes, but if they say, oh, you actually need algebra to be a successful machinist or, or to, to have this kind of good paying job, I think the motivation would be higher. Uh, I, I think there's terribly low career information uh, for a lot, and I think we all would agree on that. People need to know more about what skills are required in the economy for success, for career success, and the earlier we start that, the better and the more motivated students would be to undertake the basic skill development that they, that they need. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Logan, one key question that we should be answering with WIOA reauthorization is how we can bolster employer engagement with our workforce programs and WIOA participants. And you gave a great description of what you do in your company to, to help workers. How can a WIOA reauthorization start attracting good employers like IBM for middle to high skill jobs? I think uh, making sure that there are opportunities to connect to workforce boards and the, making sure that the transparency is there in the data. The quality of the programs that are preparing people for employment in companies really matters for companies to participate. Great. Thank you. My time has expired and I yield back. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now recognize Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Logan, uh, you've provided a number of insightful comments and insights about your partnership uh, and workforce development at IBM, so thank you for that. I'd like to build on that. Um, in my district, we're very fortunate to have two excellent community colleges, Onondaga Community College and Mohawk Valley Community College in New York's 22nd district. These excellent institutions are actively involved in workforce development and partnering with local employers, particularly around skill-based certificate uh, education that are exactly targeted to both the needs in our community, the needs of the employers, and opportunities for these aspiring students. Um, they partner in a lot of ways, but uh, you know, it really falls along technology, even cybersecurity, manufacturing, healthcare, and the hospitality industries. All of these really are covered. Um, can you give any insight as to what are the best practices for these community colleges? I try very hard to partner with them and, and to be a good partner for them. Um, what's the best way for them to partner with industry and companies from your perspective? Any advice you have? Absolutely. Uh, we work closely with several community colleges in a variety of ways from providing uh, expert lectures in, in key technical areas we have our skills build program that we offer to community colleges so that they can have uh, current content at no cost to them. We help them with uh, pathways that are both degree and non-degree content from IBM. We also offer our digital credentials. I think those are things that community colleges can do with industry to ensure that they are offering key skills that, that employers are looking for and give students the opportunity to earn digital credentials that signal to the market that those students have the skills employers are seeking. That's a great list, thank you. Um, can you advise me, what is it that we in Congress, what can the federal government do to support or encourage, you know, particularly in this context, um, these kinds of partnership programs that, uh, that you're describing? Well, one of them would be a short-term Pell uh, revision. That would mm -hmm. make a tremendous difference. Okay. Can you expand on that? And I've heard some comments on that just uh, to get it in this context. Absolutely. We know that uh, many people are not going to brick and mortar institutions. They may be learning online. They may not be seeking a degree and they may not need a degree in order to gain employment. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that there are quality opportunities for them to gain the skills they need and short term Pell would help to close that gap. It's part of the larger ecosystem. Great. Thank you. And I've heard that also from uh, from the community college presidents as well. Um, I just want to touch on individual training accounts, um, and it's open for anyone to, uh, 
to react to it. Many aspiring and ambitious students are seeking these critical skills that we're talking about to advance themselves, to provide for their families, uh, and they find it hard to come up even with the, the minimum tuition payment. Uh, I think one example was $1,200 for a phlebotomy class, uh, and there's a great story of a single mom driving an hour and a half, two or three times a week, um, just to get this class and certificate so that she could um, provide for her family, and that has a really great outcome and success story. Um, how would ITAs help meet this need, um, even at these low dollar numbers? Uh, what can we do in Congress to provide this boost? boost? Can anybody provide any insight for uh, individual training accounts, pro or con? I would say we could do better with that. I, I think the funding levels are too low. Right now, on average, $2,000 is only enough to provide training for quite low-wage jobs. Um, I agree about short-term Pell, as long as it have, has the appropriate safeguards. There's a lot of very ineffective programs, and I'm sorry to say that most for-profit providers, on average, those programs don't have value. Uh, not all, but some. So we need good accountability for that money. We need higher levels. And that's why the support services are so important. You get the voucher, but the staff has to have extensive knowledge of exactly which jobs in the economy are appropriate for that particular person. And, and that requires some resources. That, that requires good training for the staff at the job centers as well. So, so I think that combination uh, could enable us to do better. One thing I'd like to add is we need to think about the larger ecosystem of opportunities for people to gain skills. So there are programs that we offer, like Skills Build, it's free and available to the public. You can think about that as the, at the wider end of the funnel. People can log on, create an account, learn for free, earn an IBM digital credential. They may need the next level of skilling after that. That's where they may use an ITA or use uh, something else. They may go, you know, use short-term Pell, go to a, a project-based learning program, a boot camp. There are levels of skilling that people may need in order to get the job they're seeking, and we need to make sure that people a, are aware of those opportunities. When we did our morning consult study a year ago, we found most people don't know, 60%, don't know where to start and don't know that uh, techn technological training is available to them. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McBeth, I would now recognize. Thank you, uh, Chairman Owens and Ranking Member Wilson, and to your staff and to our witnesses for being here today, and I hope you can hear me. I've kind of lost my voice. Um, since it was signed into law in 2014 with the help of Chairwoman Fox, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or we'll refer uh, to it as WIOA, has really assisted millions of American workers in helping themselves gain the skills necessary to be able to succeed in today's country, in our economy. It has inspired people who may have had to drop out of high school to start working sooner than they expected or to go back to school to make better lives for themselves and their families and their loved ones. It has helped families in districts like mine, Georgia 7th, help them to learn English, where roughly a quarter of the population of my district was actually born outside of the United States and many of them don't speak English as their first language. Stories like these kind of illustrate how important it is that we continue to reauthorize WIOA and ensure that it gets the necessary funding that it needs to expand upon the successes that we've had with it. Congress must really take action to reverse the decades-long trend of declining public investment in our workforce development programs. As I said in this committee many times before, the federal government spends significantly less today on workforce development programs than it did over 20 years ago in 2001. My bill, the Train for Better America Act, which was included in the bipartisan WIOA reauthorization that passed the House last Congress, would assist community colleges and technical schools in connecting recent and upcoming graduates with employers in their area to fill the workforce shortages by making the Strengthening Community Colleges Training Grant Program at DOL permanent. 
We know that community colleges and technical training schools like Gwinnett Tech in my district in Lawrenceville and Georgia Piedmont Technical College in Clarkston are some of the best and the most frequent providers of training for our workforce system. Yet, there is no dedicated funding to support these community colleges through WIOA. The Train Act would actually authorize over $770 million for our nation's community colleges to develop and sustain job training programs for job seekers with barriers to employment. Ms. or Dr. Holzer, I have two questions for you, and I hope we can get to both. What value do you believe that community colleges bring to the workforce system? And do you think a WIO reauthorization needs to include targeted funding specifically for our community colleges? Um, thank you for both of those questions. Uh, community colleges are the only institution in America that could deliver job training at a scale remotely close uh, to what our labor force and our economy needs. So they could potentially play an enormous role. Uh, unfortunately, I think so far the performance is more mixed, coming as some do much better than others. Um, we know that community colleges, we expect them to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of things. We expect them to have a purely academic mission to be a stepping stone to four-year programs, which some do well. We expect them to do really effective job training. But many, many of them are strapped for cash. Uh, they simply can't do so many different functions really well. For instance, most students get very, very little career guidance. Uh, at community colleges. I mean, they, they might see a, an academic advisor once a semester who checks off their courses, but that's not real career guidance. And, and frankly, a lot of community colleges can't afford to provide more of that guidance and more of the support services a lot of students need. Uh, I, I think another issue is this, this divide between for credit and not for credit. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, a, a lot of students, if they did badly in high school, they may not be academically prepared for some of the better four credit classes requiring the community colleges. So without short-term Pell, which I think all of us have agreed on some version of that's really important, but it requires the community colleges to do all kinds of creative uh, work to try to reach those students and provide them with what they need. Um, and, and I think you know, more dollars for things like career guidance uh, and for teaching capacity. You know, and another thing we have to remember is that a lot of these industries, especially in IT and advanced manufacturing, they change very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the skills can become obsolete very quickly. And community colleges sometimes can be a little bit bureaucratic, less bureaucratic on the not-for-credit side, uh, which is why those programs are important. But they also need more funds to support capacity building, effective capacity building, uh, as well as good interactions with, with the employers with need in those districts. Thank you so much. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, I'd like now, now, uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. James. Looks like I'm on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've heard a number of amazing and informative things, and I want to say thank you uh, for each of your care and, uh, and service to, uh, to folks who are seeking the American dream in every corner of this country. Uh, I've heard a number of things that I um, vehemently agree with, uh, and it's, it's so refreshing uh, to be on the same page, especially uh, with our Democratic colleagues. Among the things that I, I very much agree with uh, was what our, our ranking member uh, said earlier today. Uh, in her statement, she mentioned two fundamental goals reauthorization must achieve, expanding job seekers' access to workforce programs and meeting the needs of business. She also stated, and I agree quite strongly, that um, reauthorization of WIOA-based training and sector partnerships can help businesses find workers they need with higher paying jobs. Effective reauthorization must put access first, quality and innovation also that meets the needs of workers and business. I, as a, as a former business uh, uh, leader and uh, representing the Michigan's 10th Congressional District, the Arsenal Democracy, uh, number one manufacturing district in the entire nation know how important it is uh, to make sure we have a workforce that's ready and that the American dream is accessible and attainable. Um, I, based upon the comments of the ranking member earlier, 
um, would estimate that we agree there should be no wrong path. There should be no wrong path to pursue the American dream. I also really appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Logan's comments about skills recognized by industry. I think that many of us would also agree that at the local level, businesses um, and, uh, and industry-led institutions are probably better to determine what's needed than we are here in Washington, D.C. Um, programs that um, would allow paid work, written training programs, written apprenticeship agreements, specialized knowledge, promote safety, equal employment opportunity, credit for prior knowledge and experience, mentorship, industry-recognized credentials, and disclosure of costs and fees for transparency, which would move people forward is something that we also agree with. What I just listed and described are exactly what industry-recognized apprenticeships program provided that was repealed by the Madden administration. Mr. Palash, given your experience at DOL, can you explain to me what the rationale may have been behind that decision and if you believe in your estimation that was the right decision? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, I do believe it was the right decision. I believe the intention was to create yet another pathway for individuals to achieve the American dream, to achieve the skills development that they need. We, we talk about multiple pathways all the time, and the IRAP program was designed to create yet another pathway for an individual to take. We've also talked quite- sorry. So the repeal was the wrong decision? I did not agree with the repeal. Okay. Having, having been the individual who signed the, the rule into law uh, under the previous administration, I was, I was um, dismayed to see that, that that rule was rolled back. Um, and the reason being is we've talked a lot today about administrative burden, and that was another thing we were trying to do, is we were trying to, to take the Department of Labor, take my office out of that decision-making process and push that down to the, to the states, push that down to the trade organizations, the employer groups, the folks who actually knows, knows, know what's needed, and taking some of that onus off of the Department of Labor, because I don't know what occupation should be apprenticeable at the federal level. I need the local folks to tell me that. So I, I did not agree with the, the action. I think it, it took away an avenue for individuals to, to achieve that American dream, and that's, that's unfortunate. I firmly believe, and I think we agree, that when the federal government believes they know better um, what businesses and locals need, that is where we run afoul. Um, offering opportunities to earn and learn while obtaining valuable, portable, industry-recognized, competency-based credentials are very important. Um, in the last 30 seconds we have, uh, Ms. Logan, uh, you listed four items that should be priorities. Can you relist those for us again, please? I think they're very important. Absolutely. Align higher education and workforce development laws to focus on skills, dedicate individual training accounts for workforce development, reform the el eligible training provider list, and focus on transparency and outcomes. That's outstanding. I believe IRAPs achieve all of those. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. I would now like to uh, recognize Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for your thoughtful testimony this morning. I um, you know, appreciate the fact that you opened this hearing by reminding us that um, in 2014 it was a bipartisan initiative that passed the last authorization of WIOA. Uh, Congresswoman Bonamici and I were comparing photographs because we were in the executive office building at the bill signing. I would have a nice picture of uh, Chairwoman Fox standing uh, behind President Obama at the time that was uh, signed, and um, it, it really, you know, was an extraordinary event. Um, you know, uh, but having said that, uh, it was not the Ten Commandments, and we obviously have a job to do to to update and reauthorize and make improvements uh, to WIOA, and uh, and really looking at the, in my opinion, extraordinary sort of consensus. Uh, of the four witnesses here today on a number of issues, uh, I, I think there's great hope that we can, you know, with good faith, um, you know, try to put together uh, an intelligent uh, change in, in terms of the, the program that's there. Um, in my district, uh, which is the home of Electric Boat, uh, which is a, a shipbuilder that builds nuclear-powered submarines um, that is now on a huge trajectory of growth because of um, a change in focus by the Congress in terms of appropriations as well as the Navy. Um, we, again, have seen a, a hiring um, 
demand in terms of the metal trades um, that, um, you know, sort of in the late 90s to mid 2000s sort of atrophied in terms of the just the numbers of people and also the focus of trade schools as well as uh, job training programs. The good news is that uh, WIOA, in my opinion, succeeded in terms of bringing together um, the employer, the trade unions uh, who have been part of this um, extraordinary company going back to the 1930s and, and crafting a curriculum that in an accelerated fashion has re resulted in over 3,000 graduates uh, that 90% plus have been immediately hired and the job retention is a smashing success. 10 weeks for welding, eight weeks for electricians, uh, eight weeks for uh, CNC machinists. Um, the only thing that's been holding us back, as I mentioned to Dr. Holzer this morning, is really just that there's insufficient funding to get more slots. The hiring target this year for EB is 5,750 jobs in 2023. So again, you know, the, the, the need to, to look at the authorized and appropriated funding levels in my district is, is number, issue number one, two, and three. Part of that funding, and, and again, Ms. Logan, in your testimony, you talked about the fact that IBM has made this process free for workers in terms of going through the pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. That's also key. I mean, you, it, the 10 weeks for welding is very intensive. You can't just hit a pause button on your life in terms of daycare and transportation, paying the rent, and, and get through this, this process there. So, Mr. Dr. Holter, again, in your testimony, you talked about the fact that this is just a reality in terms of the, the number of job openings in the economy and just the real life needs of people to be able to afford going through these transformational training programs, and, and is that, again, what you were focused on in your testimony? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I agree with, with your, your summary of that. Uh, it's great to hear success stories, and we've heard a number of success stories today that I've actually been very happy to hear. We have to be honest about the level of demand, the need for funds out there relative to the resources that are available. And you know, the programs you described really do require trainees to come in with a fairly high level of basic reading and math literacy, digital literacy, et cetera. We have to be honest that not all candidates for these training programs can meet those bars. That's why, in fact, uh, Title II programs are important as well, and investing in the basic literacy. And the best programs are ones that integrate a, a pathway program that starts with basic literacy and then targets the literacy support to what the skill needs and the training will be. Uh, we have some good examples of those programs, uh, and, and that's a major need as well. Thank you. Um, Ms. Logan, uh, again, IBM has a nice presence in Southbury, Connecticut. And um, yeah, I, again, I think it surprises maybe people to hear about a company like IBM using apprenticeships. But the Hartford Financial Group um, also has been you know, using apprenticeships for a number of years now for their IT. Again, there's a lot of complaints about the fact that it's too burdensome to be participate in the Fitzgerald Act registered. But the Hartford Insurance Group, what I've heard is they they had no problem, you know, um, setting up the program in accordance with the law. What was IBM's experience with registered apprenticeships? So first, I'd like to say work-based learning is important in in all forms, right? Work-based learning compared with quality programs. With regard to apprenticeships. For IBM, it was important to do a registered apprenticeship. We're a national company. We're very large. We wanted to make sure both for us and for participants that when they, if they stay with IBM and a thousand of them are now IBM employees or whether they move on to another company, it's recognized where they go next by other employers. For smaller, you know, smaller companies, they may have a different uh, situation. We had to do the bridge between the skills, the technical skills for our apprenticeship job roles and what the registered uh, job roles were. So there is some work involved, for sure, and the modernization would advantage of the program and allow for more employers to participate. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to recognize uh, the um, chair of the full committee, Dr. Fox. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witnesses for being here, and Mr. Courtney, uh, maybe we owe in 2014 wasn't the Ten Commandments, but like the Ten Commandments, we owe has not been honored as we had hoped it would be. Uh, so uh, 
I think I point out all the time that all, all we've ever needed, we don't need all these laws we've passed now, all we've ever needed was the Ten Commandments. Everything, every action we take could be com contained within the Ten Commandments. So um, un unfortunately, um, we all has not been adhered to like Ten Commandments haven't been. Ms. Logan, you recommend dedicating WIOA funding toward what I like to call individualized education accounts. I don't use the T word, uh, and work-based learning. What impact would it have for job seekers and employers if a greater share of WIOA dollars were consistently available for upskilling? We believe it would allow us, us to serve more people that right having addition more dollars in the, of the allowable dollars dedicated to skilling programs would help us to serve more people and prepare them for available jobs right and everybody has said including mr holzer that uh too much money is going to administrators bureaucrats feather their own nest with we owe our money and that's the reason only about 20 percent to 30 percent i saw that when i was a community college president and we've been frustrated by breaking that mold. Uh, Mr. Palish, in 2020, DOL established a website to increase transparency and accountability in the workforce system. Yet almost three years later, the site still lacks basic performance data on most eligible programs and providers. Why don't we have the data? What will it take to fix it? And what does this say about the current state of accountability in the system? Thank you for your question. and and. I think it's important to note that I was the one who launched that website because I knew coming from the state of Kentucky that the training programs in Kentucky were not performing. You mean the education programs? I'm sorry, yes. The, the, the eligible education <laughs> programs, yes. So I, I knew that, that, that we were providing customer choice to individuals, but we were giving them bad choices. And if the state of Kentucky didn't know whether the programs were good or bad, and if the Department of Labor doesn't know whether the programs are good or bad, how can we possibly expect the individual job seeker to know? So I, I think that, that that is the crux of what we're here to talk about, is making sure we can talk about funding levels, but putting more money into a, a system that doesn't have the accountability and doesn't have the performance isn't going to generate the results we want it to. We Thank first, you for that. That's we, a wonderful way to say it. Yeah, we, 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 have to, we have to clean up the process first, and we have to leverage work-based learning and on-the-job training and come at worker training. We have to leverage apprenticeships. And then those programs that are on the ETPL, we have to make sure those are the highest performing programs. And then we can infuse more money to make sure that individuals are being pushed and, and directed towards programs that are going to succeed. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson, you discussed how cutting down on administrative waste in the system, which I've alluded to already, and so has everybody else, will allow local workforce boards to focus more funding on skills development. Do you believe consolidating similar workforce programs would make the system more efficient and empower local leaders to achieve better results? Very simply, yes. Well, that's, that's a succinct answer, and we appreciate that. Again, we worked on that in 2014 with, um, with what we did with WIOA. Uh, Ms. Ferguson, I'd like to, I mean, sorry, Ms. Logan, I'd like to come back to you. Um, several years ago, IBM in, instituted a program I understood in Bedford-Stuyvesant in high schools where they began with high school students. And you may not be aware of this program, and if you're not, that's okay. But my understanding was, and I can't remember what they called it, but where IBM went into the high schools and developed the curriculum Students enrolled in the ninth grade and went through for four years. And my understanding was at the time, and it's been several years since anyone's talked with me about it, that at the end of the four years, they were guaranteed an interview, not guaranteed a job, but guaranteed an interview. Could you, if you have information, would you bring us up to date on that? And if you don't, could you send it after the hearing? I'd be happy to send more information after. That's our Pathways and Technology Education Program. It's the P-TECH program. T-TECH, that's it. Yeah, it's an early college high school model. It's a career, uh, career to uh, high school pathway. Uh, there are many Pathways high school models now out there, um, and we believe it includes high school plus work-based learning plus higher ed. Those students earn an associate's degree. They get internships at IBM. They also have 
um, work-based learning while they're in high school. That's a wonderful model for high school, and I'm happy to talk uh, afterwards more about that. I happen to think that this is actually the model that we need to be following in our country everywhere. North Carolina is doing a great job on early college, and we give free community college courses to high school students, and many students now are graduating from high school with their high school diploma, as well as an AA or an AAS degree and credentials so that they can go immediately into a job. And I, I really think we can't wait till students graduate from high school to, to start working on um, helping them gain the skills they need for a productive career. Thank you again. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I went over, but. Thank you, um, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Fox, appreciate it. Uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Uh, Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member uh, Wilson, and thank you to the witnesses. I'm uh, really glad we're having this conversation, and I, I really see the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and as, as Representative Courtney said, was at the bill signing. It was the first bill signing I attended. I see it as a vision for a, a demand-driven workforce system that really has the dual goals of getting people into jobs but also meeting the needs in the, in the industry. And of course, funding is critical. And as Dr. Holzer testified, we don't have enough funding. It's pretty clear that there's a tremendous amount of potential there. Um, and I, I wanna focus on a couple of things. Um, I, I know the importance of um, helping people historically face barriers to getting into good jobs. That's important as well. Uh, a couple comments. First of all, I'm planning to reintroduce both my Partners Act and Builds Act. We hear a lot about industry partnerships. The Partners Act, which has been historically bipartisan, we're hoping to keep it that way, uh, will help especially smaller and medium-sized businesses uh, with, with the workforce and apprenticeship programs, and also the Builds Act, which is specifically designed to help people get into construction trades and, and trades that help build uh, the infrastructure that we so desperately need. Uh, again, a bipartisan piece of legislation we're planning to reintroduce. I also want to mention as a graduate of a community college the importance of the work of community colleges. Portland Community College, for example, in the district I'm honored to represent has an amazing mechatronics program, for example, because we have a huge semiconductor industry and they get people ready to work in advanced manufacturing. We have an amazing industry partnership called the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center with lots of private industry working with not only our higher education institutes but also Portland Community College uh, to get people ready for uh, advanced and additive manufacturing. Lots of models there, but the potential to do so much more with more funding is, is real. Uh, and, and with regard to career and technical education as the co-chair of the CTE caucus, um, we can't start young enough uh, when, when we see it, it isn't only getting the skills, it's also the hands-on um, education that keeps students engaged. I just visited St. Helens High School in a rural part of the district I represent where they have eight different CTE programs. It's amazing what they can do. Dr. Holzer, I want to talk about apprenticeships. We know the successful model, 93% of apprentices um, receive uh, employment and uh, make a good salary, uh, good paying jobs. In fact, in my home state of Oregon, we had more than 10,600 people go through apprenticeship programs in 2022. So as, as we are considering reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act and the National Apprenticeship Act, which has not been updated since the 1930s, what should we be doing to lower the barriers to entry? Uh, and are there policies we should consider to make it easier for businesses to host apprenticeships? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think there's broad agreement that uh, registered apprenticeships, the entry barriers, the hurdles need to be streamlined. Uh, my sense is that the current drafts of revisions in the National Apprenticeship Act uh, would help to do that. Uh, the exact details are, go beyond my, my, my level of expertise, but, but I think that's the direction we all agree on. Uh, now, I. Unlike uh, Mr. Palish, I would have some concerns about programs like IRAP uh, because all the evidence that we have is on registered apprenticeships. Uh, we simply have no evidence on the effectiveness of these alternative right. programs. That doesn't mean that they I, I shouldn't that. exist. I, I but, share that concern. Yeah, but, but what we know uh, uh, is registered apprenticeship. I'm open to uh, expanding with other other versions of that, but that's what the focus needs to be: streamlining outreach to employers. Right. Now, I'll, I'll I'll refer to a, a a red state like South Carolina, 
and she does a very nice job of outreach to employers, some tax credits, uh, a comprehensive model, and I think that that's a nice approach. But I, but I think we want to use the opportunity to reauthorize uh, the National Apprenticeship Act to, to bring those barriers down and create some resources for outreach to support some of these very nice yeah, state we'll models, that innovative model. models. I just have a little bit of time left, and I, and I just want to, Dr. Holzer, if we could just touch briefly on uh, the, the 2002 legislation that codified reentry grants, so services are made available to those reentering uh, the market after leaving the justice system. And we know the evidence is there. Rand did a report. It's a good return on investment. We have a fabulous program in Oregon called Constructing Hope for, for people who get out of the criminal justice system and then get a job in the trades. So, so why should a future reauthorization make these services a priority? Uh, it, it, it's so important. Uh, we have incarcerated way too many people in America, but when they're coming out, uh, and, and, and a lot of people come out having been uh, disconnected to the school system, uh, uh, th they need supports. Uh, and and sometimes, that, sometimes they're not ready for a really rigorous training program. It might be basic literacy. It might be other services just to make sure that they are housed in a safe place. But the best programs prevent recidivism. Recidivism exactly. is so expensive. So, so not only does it help them get into an economy at a time when there's some shortage of, of employees, but, but it, when you prevent recidivism, it's a strong return for the entire country and the entire economy. Uh, and and that's, that's the main reason uh, in, in favor. And in some cases, you also need things like subsidized jobs for a while. Uh, for people that are not quite ready for the more rigorous demands Improved of the private sector. Programs. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would now like to recognize Mr. Good. Thank you, Chairman Owens. Again, thank you to all of our witnesses for your submitted written and expressed testimony here today. One of the top concerns I hear, and I think most many of my colleagues hear from employers in our districts, is the inability to find workers with the right skills. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why we're here today. But in light of the uh, Title 42 expiration uh, today uh, that is throwing gasoline on the already raging fire that is the border invasion. I think since that affects everything, I think it's appropriate to ask how flooding the labor market, flooding the country with millions of unskilled, non-English speaking illegal aliens impacts the labor market. Would anyone say in our panel that uh, this helps employers who are seeking more skilled labor? somewhat rhetorical. Would anyone say that this helps increase wages for Americans? Would anyone say this helps employers? This is part of our jurisdiction in this committee. Would anyone say this helps employers provide better health care for their, their current workers? Would anyone say this helps enhance the education excellence for our K-12 children and the quality of teaching and learning for American children you know, as we require every school to accommodate every illegal that's here and whatever is their native language? Uh, I would like to submit for the record, official record of this hearing, a uh, document that I have from uh, Federation for American Immigration Reform. And in my home state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, it says uh, we have an estimated already 419,000 illegal aliens residing in Virginia, uh, 123,000 of which are students in our uh, K-12 schools. The average cost to Virginians is 5,000 annually per illegal alien. A uh, total of nearly $3 billion, $2.84 billion in costs, which costs the average household in Virginia right at about $900. Uh, shifting gears to more specifically to what the purpose of this hearing is, uh, Mr. Ferguson, um, how has uh, this historically tight labor market created new opportunities to establish work-based learning partnerships with employers, and how could WIOA be updated to support more employer engagement? So for us, um, for, to, to have the opportunity through the WIOA funding to help a business upskill their workforce and increase their productivity is just one measure of a way that, that we can help both the worker and the business make it through a tight labor market. Um, creating programs and showing companies how to build a workforce pipeline through work-based learning where we can provide some very entry-level short-term training for instance for a certified nursing assistant may take four to six weeks and they can go right to work and then add on we talked about uh, phlebotomy certification earlier is another short-term training that we have done as an add-on bolt-on skill 
that increases that individual's wage by two to three dollars per hour mm. and it gives the hospital that many more phlebotomists that are able to work from there we have individuals going on to licensed practical nursing so businesses are figuring out with our help how to build their pipeline and build their workforce internally Thank you for being part of the solution with your career centers, by the way, the private solution that is always better than government solutions. Uh, what have you found that works best, in, though, in developing partnerships between state and local workforce, workforce boards and employers? And then what are some of the challenges that prevent employers from collaborating with the public workforce system? So for us, the biggest key is being active members in our business community organizations are uh, industry associations such as the First Coast Manufacturers Association, we have staff that are in the workforce uh, particular uh, subcommittees that those industry associations have, understanding our economic development targeted industries, knowing your business community is the key for us to invest the dollars that we do have in areas that are, that are growing. So that if a worker may not work for company A, but they're in the distribution and logistics industry within our area, which is very strong, we know we can get them to company B or company C. Thank so. you, sir. Mr. Palash, one last question for you. If, if the Department of Labor was less involved in workforce development, leaving employers to work on it, what do you think that would do for our economy? I, I think that's the key is, is the Department of Labor's responsibility is to foster an environment where that happens, where employers are working with their local workforce boards, as, as Bruce has described, working with the other workforce partners to find solutions that are best for them in that part of the, the state or that part of the country, because folks here in D.C., myself included, don't necessarily know what Central Texas needs versus you know, Northern California, and it, it's much best left up to them. But the Department of Labor does have a role, and it's fostering that type of environment and not being not being the, the big bad cops all the time. It, it's, it's working with them to, so that the locals, as, as Bruce has done, take advantage of the flexibilities that exist. So we need to make sure they're aware of that and encourage them to do that. Well said. We could apply that to a lot of government uh, that we should just facilitate the private sector to thrive and succeed. So thank you for succinctly answering that. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to now yield to uh, Ms. Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses today for joining us this morning, uh, certainly a topic that we need to talk about. Uh, Dr. Hoser, because funding for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is not mandatory, funding may fluctuate and, and even be reduced during times of heightened demand for training services. So have you seen an increase in demand for job training during the COVID uh, pandemic? And how could the federal government provide equitable outcomes for disadvantaged communities through funding? I, I think COVID was very unusual because it, it, it affected, it limited both the supply and the demand for education. Enrollment in community colleges declined, et cetera. Now, in most cyclical downturns, training is countercyclical, right? When, when, the, when, the, when the labor market isn't that good, that's a good time for people to go and train. Uh, and I, I think it would be nice if there were some mandatory dollars uh, that are tied to the state of the business cycle. In, in many, uh, many other areas, many other programs, we're trying to improve the automatic stabilizer role of support programs like SNAP and, and other things like that. And I, th I think we could probably do some of that with, uh, with WIOA dollars as well. Uh, on the equity issue, I, I, think, I think right now, People of color, uh, broadly defined, constitute, they're overrepresented in the WIOA population, so they benefit more from these dollars than anyone else. Now, the average impacts are roughly the same in percentage terms for people of color. Uh, as for white people, we wish they were a little higher. But in fact, you know, so, so I, think, I think a lot of the improvements we've talked about today, plus some res extra resources, could make the system better serve. And, and of course, the whole adult program is really designed for the disadvantaged population, people who often start with, with, with a fairly low level of work experience and basic skills, sort of more resources, and, and with the appropriate accountability in that system, I think, uh, would increase its equity value. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Logan, uh, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that 
You believe that Congress should dedicate funding for um, individual accounts uh, incre uh, to increase dollar limits on incumbent worker programs, and, and uh, we should also enhance work-based learning uh, programs. So could you talk a little bit about the wraparound services and how the program distribution has, has impacted um, the workforce at, co at companies like IBM? Sure, let me start with uh, incumbent workers. Thank you for the question. Uh, as Mr. Ferguson said earlier, there are opportunities for people to start with WIO dollars, earn a credential, get employment, but there may be other short-term programs they could get to go to the next level. And those kinds of upskilling opportunities that would allow them to get a few more dollars per hour and continue on a career trajectory are why uh, incumbent worker incumbent workers should be included in the ITAs. We also believe that there are opportunities for people to get training that are not currently uh, working for them. They're not necessarily work-based learning. They're not necessarily right, high quality. These are some of the points we've been talking about, and we need to make sure that those are all part of the revisions that this committee is considering. IBM offers programs that are for free. I know we've in the past talked about several of them, and some of them we're working with HBCUs on. Our cybersecurity centers are benefiting from our, our uh, digital credentials that we offer. But we can build on what's available to people and then make sure that they have the opportunity to continue to use more resources that are available to align with employer needs locally quality programs and get them into jobs. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all of your uh, work uh, with our HBCUs. We appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm going to yield back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Halchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you guys for coming to testify today. I'm actually very excited to continue this conversation about the WIOA reauthorization um, and how we can improve the skills gap and address the workforce shortage. Um, the state of the workforce continues to change. Um, right now, if you want a job, you can find it. We owe over the past was connecting job seekers to jobs, and uh, we have about 40% of the uh, able-bodied population not engaging in the workforce. So I would like to see a reauthorization that keeps that issue in mind, promoting incentives that would en engage the 40% um, and utilize Work One and other programs uh, to encourage those to participate in the workforce and provide the skilling up that they need to do the jobs of, of today. Um, one of the things I'm considering in this Congress is a tiered tax credit uh, for employers who are retaining new employees, allowing, um, you know, out of the 40 percent, um, allowing more workforce programs funds, funds to be extended to adult education opportunities like the Goodwill Excel Center in my district. Uh, in Clarksville, Indiana. I've been there, seen it firsthand. They're doing amazing work um, at, at taking that marginal population and providing them an education and opportunities that they might not otherwise have. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, I believe uh, workforce programs are most successful when employers are in the driver's seat. What have you found to work best in developing partnerships with employers? So uh, I would agree. Uh, our board agrees with that philosophy of the business knows best what, what skills they need. So when our board sets that kind of a tone for us as professional staff, it's my job to make sure we understand what our business community skill needs are. Mm -hmm. We do that through, as I, as I said uh, in my testimony, with our economic development councils, by being part of our chambers of commerce, by participating in uh, advisory councils for our state college system. We sit so we're hearing what industry is asking for from our colleges. It's really all about partnerships and understanding your local labor market so that we can coach our job seekers that are coming into the career centers. Here's where your areas of best opportunity lie. And to that point, um, do you think it would be beneficial for us to consider legislation that concerns a tiered tax credit program where employers could work with workforce boards as they retain employers for, say, three, six employees in that 40 percent uh, for three, six, nine or 12 months? Certainly any kind of a, a tax credit program or something like it needs to be simple to use. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if it takes too much yeah. to get the credit, business won't do it. Right. 
Um, and then, uh, would you consider supporting employers in reskilling workers um, as part of this um, reauthorization? So, would you consider a program that would uh, support employers in helping to reskill the workforce? Right. So. I think it's there with the current ability to do the customized training types of things that we do uh, to make it more explicit, to encourage it in some way that it kind of opens the door to, to other uh, workforce boards and other states to understand this tool and how to use it would be very beneficial. So clarifying this, the, what already exists and making sure it's advertised. Yes. Um, Mr. Ferguson, my time in social services showed me that we should be focusing on young adults aging out of foster care. Uh, 20, as you may know, tw over 23,000 children age out of foster care every year. 20% of them become instantly homeless upon aging out. Uh, furthermore, only half of those young adults will have gainful employment by the age of 24. Do you have any suggestions on how, through this, we can engage that demographic in the workforce? So the, the best thing that we can try to do is to, is to get to those kids before they age out. Correct. Um, and show them what the opportunities are in the labor market to introduce them to potential training programs and for us to connect them to employment as soon as possible because you can build skills while you, while you work. Do you think we're reaching those students early enough now? Are those Pro foster children early Probably not, or, or you would not end up with the homeless situation right. that we may have. Okay. Um, thank you. I look forward to continuing this discussion on the reauthorization. I've got lots of thoughts on how we can make improvements. I appreciate you being here today. My goal is to uh, support job creators in the workforce in Indiana and across the country. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize Mr. <coughs> Mr. DeCano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first question is for uh, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, you highlight some success for job seekers, specifically with job seekers in uh, certified nursing assistant programs. Uh, you state a majority of them earned a significant wage after passing the CNA certification exam. And this is a very real accomplishment, and I applaud you for that success. But I wonder, what is next for these individuals? They are now earning, in many instances, $12.29 an hour, which is a decent starting wage, but still not enough to raise a family or to be sustainable over a whole career. Um, this is an arena that we need to focus on in the next WIOA reauthorization. So my, my question is, how can WIOA play a role in these individuals' more long-term career, career paths? Well, so thank you for that question. And I, what we're trying to set forth in that particular example is that's the starting point for us. We continue to engage with that particular hospital and they look forward to, and we've done follow-on employed worker training where we have helped those CNAs become an LPN, which again, boosts that income and, and fills a need for the hospital and you know, gives the opportunity for that particular worker to upskill and, and earn more money. So, But how, but how can WIOA play a role in, in So we people? utilize the customized training dollars to do that uh -huh. exact thing. So the, the funding that we have and the employers paying for half of this because they've got a benefit up, you know, from that as well, from having a, now I have an LPN field that I didn't have and it's easier for us at our workforce career center level to go replace another CNA with a very short term training and just get that pipeline going. Well, how can we all support lifelong learning and a sustainable career pathway? Because 1229 is a start, but are, are there, right. do you have ideas about how we can use WIO to, to, to support the lifelong learning and sustainable career pathway? Exactly, and, and I'll go back to the apprenticeship program that Flagler Health Plus put in place they were taking individuals that worked at the hospital. Some of them were in administrative entry-level jobs or the food service area of the hospital. Through a, a one year, just a 12-month apprenticeship program, went from a starting wage of 15 in that program, and when they graduate as a surgical technician, they're making over, 20, or over $19 an hour. So that's a really significant gain in a short period of time. 
Um, well, thank you. Dr. Holzer, a, a recent study by the Harvard Project on, workforce, on the workforce found that of the 75,000 programs across the United States on, eligible training, on the eligible training provider lists, or ETPLs, 75,000 or 75 percent, 75 percent could not report uh, on critical information of their program like employment rates, earnings, and credentials. And while I would like to see greater focus on skills-based hiring, I'm concerned that without transparency on the type of credentials being trained for, we risk making the situation worse and causing harm to low-income populations who need this information to make informed an informed choice. How can we address this issue of transparency for credentials? Uh, thank you, Mr. Takano. Uh, it starts with making sure the right data are available. Uh, and and I, I would prefer individual records to be more available so you could really track the progress of each individual uh, in those in those programs. Um, we are making some progress. I, I think the ETPL lists have a lot of problems in their current form in terms of the ability of people to be able to navigate them. They're not transparent right now. Uh, and, and as well as the ability to use those to weed out less effective programs. Uh, but, but several states, and in fact the program Credential Engine, uh, is, is making some nice progress. And, gathering the data and making it in a digestible form for job seekers, for program administrators, so making sure people have the right resource supporting efforts like that to improve the quality of the wage data, uh, I, I think would be a good first step. Well, well thank you, uh, Dr. Holter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Logan, I want to address a statement made by IBM CEO Arvind Krishna just last week that roughly 7,800 of IBM's jobs could be slowed or eliminated entirely by artificial intelligence. How is IBM planning to balance offering good paying, stable roles to American workers while competing in a high stakes environment in which our competitors, including uh, international ones, uh, might be relying on AI? Sure, absolutely, uh, and thank you for the question. The technology industry, as we all know, is a rapid pace uh, evolving sector. We are continuously increasing our own skills as IBMers. We're all required to do a minimum of 40 hours of learning a year to maintain and increase the skills that we have. In addition to that, we are offering programs, many of which I've talked about today, our skills build program, which is available to the public. It offers AI and cybersecurity and digital uh, data analytics, et cetera, so that people can learn for free with current content. It is important for, for this WIOA program to focus on making sure that people have those skills that are the skills of today and tomorrow. It is also important that we think about the fact that some jobs will be eliminated, some jobs will shift, and new jobs will be created. AI is a tool. It is something that is going to shift and change the way that we work and the way that jobs are shaped. It's not new, it's been around for a long time. I think it was 2011 that Watson won Jeopardy. So it's really about how we use it and not just about the thing itself. So we need to make sure people have the skills that they need in order to leverage AI in the jobs of today. So I, I appreciate that it's interesting that um, you require continuing education for your employees, but is there, a, is there an ongoing uh, effort by IBM uh, leadership to take care of those people, who, those workers who you know their jobs be eliminated by AI? Is there a well, regular discussion, it, especially about uh, artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence is something where you are using it to become more efficient. So it isn't always about what's being eliminated. It may be about how your job is shifting. So that's a big part of the reskilling that we all do is making sure that we are keeping pace with, with the, job as they, the jobs as they evolve. So 300 million jobs around the world may be lost uh, or severely diminished by AI, according to Goldman Sachs' March report. So even if it's a fraction of 300 million, 
that's still a huge number of American workers who, whose jobs are lost or disrupted by artificial intelligence. What, what sectors of the U.S. economy do we think are, do you think uh, are most vulnerable? And I'll start with you, Ms. Logan, and maybe uh, everyone else can take a shot at answering that question too. Well, first I'd say this is right. also not the first time we've seen this. Anytime we have a major technological advance, we see these shifts in the workforce. We saw it with the internet. We've seen it with advanced manufacturing. So this shift is a pattern, and this is the latest iteration of it. Would you agree? I mean, artificial intelligence is different than creating the internet. Artificial intelligence is, is explicitly designed to perform a role or a job of someone who had that role before. So but it would you distinguish that as, as being somewhat different? It still requires people to manage it. it, it so it's, it is now someone uh, who understands how to apply it in the context of what it's doing. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, I mean, what, what roles do you think are most likely to be eliminated due to especially, especially American workers' jobs? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, we've seen how technology reduces the need for the number of workers. How AI ends up impacting that is uh, something that I have not studied a lot. Uh, I'm certainly trying to keep aware of what's going on, but uh, in my readings, uh, things in the worlds of accounting and, and other areas could have significant impacts. So we'll see how it goes. Dr. Holzer, quick thought. I, I think certain sectors will be affected first. Customer service, very obviously, since a lot of that's been automated already. Almost any kind of fairly low-level research assistance or low-level writing assistance, chat GPT will do fairly soon, if, if not currently. Um, what we really need is some kind of system of lifelong learning, including for incumbent workers. So if, if a worker sees that 20 or 30 percent of her tasks are getting automated, that we help the employer help the employee pivot to a different set of tasks. Uh, and, and that's ideally, and a few states have actually have lifelong learning accounts, uh, but also various forms of tax credits for incumbent worker training to, to help employers, uh, rather than displace those workers, to help them pivot to the skills, because there will be a lot of new skills demanded uh, to replace the old ones. And, and this has been going on for over 200 years. So, but, but we need to be better about helping both workers and employers adapt to that with new forms of skill support. Thank you, my time has expired. Thank you. Um, I do now recognize Mr. Thompson. Chairman, thank you for holding this timely hearing to address one of the main challenges facing businesses across the country. At nearly every meeting with my constituents in recent months, I hear firsthand how workforce shortages impact everything from childcare to trucking. <coughs> Uh, part of these issues stem from a lack of a skilled workforce. And as co-chair of the Congressional Career and Technical Education Caucus, I'm committed to ensuring the success of these highly beneficial programs, and I believe that they provide Americans with the skills necessary to address our, our current challenges. First, a, a comment and then a question uh, uh, for, uh, for Mrs. Logan. But my first my, my comment for Ms. Ferguson is just congratulations on what you've done in Florida with with career ladders, uh, that's what you described, and I'm a product of that. I, out of high school, I, I, uh, I worked a job in a nursing home, 11 at night, seven in the morning. It would be today, it would be a, a CNA. This was before CNA, <laughs> uh, uh, but from there, I became an assistant. Uh, I worked a career ladder, became assistant therapist, a therapist, a rehab services manager, and eventually was uh, was licensed as a nursing home administrator. And I think those those career ladders fit fit well, I think, with, um, you know, with the younger population as well. Uh, uh, you, you know, it, it's not so important where you start in life, it's where you end up. And, uh, and quite frankly, I think we've known these career ladders rather well for, for some time, and, and certainly through WIOA and, and, uh, and everything else we do, we should uh, um, do our best to even make them better. Um, uh, my, my question is for uh, Ms. Logan. Uh, Ms. Logan, working at IBM, you know firsthand the importance of a highly skilled cybersecurity professionals, not just at places like IBM, but quite frankly, businesses nationwide. Anybody that touches the internet is at risk, right? Um, uh, last Congress, I was proud to co-lead the Cybersecurity Skills Integration Act, which would create a new grant program incentivizing cybersecurity education into new and established CT programs. 
Given your experience cultivating education and workforce programs at IBM, do, do you currently uh, work with CT programs to develop curriculum that addresses the cybersecurity issues and the skill sets that are needed? Uh, we thank you for the question. We have been in conversations with school districts about that. There are certainly more school districts could do around cybersecurity education. Again, our skills build program offers some entry level and exploratory content for high school students and teachers on cybersecurity. So we encourage them to explore that. Uh, there's not enough that students and teachers and every individual can know about cybersecurity and their role in keeping their own information safe on the internet and for the, any network they're participating in. That's why IBM is establishing 20 cybersecurity leadership centers with HBCUs. We work closely with, um, through Digital Promise, we've got a cybersecurity initiative there with some uh, school districts across the country. And there are multiple, we've got a cybersecurity apprenticeship program that's a year long. We need uh, cybersecurity roles filled in the United States. We committed to fill, uh, to skill 150,000 cyber uh, people in the United States. So we are hard at work on the cyber issue and absolutely there's more that can be done in the, in the high school space. Well, it, you're doing a great job. It sounds that's a pretty extensive list, a lot more than what I expected. Um, it, so the question is from your perspective, what more can Congress do to help integrate career and technical education programs uh, with employers like yourself to ensure that we have the cybersecurity workforce necessary to confront the challenges of the future? Sure, I think absolutely the CTE programs can take a look at some of the newer content that's out there and new challenges that are facing us as we've discussed today. Roles and technology are evolving all the time. We need to make sure students are lifelong learners, but also that the programs and pathways that are available are taking into account the new technologies that are out there and what's facing our nation, national security, cybersecurity uh, information, and there's opportunity for CTE to be uh, updated to include some of that. The, uh, um, Mr. Pallas, uh, we know one of the challenges with WEO is that many programs within the bill do not participate in skills development training or education, and quite frankly, many adults are simply unaware of the programs and benefits uh, available to them. Um, in your uh, in your testimony, given your experience as a former Assistant Secretary, you noted that the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration needs to be more engaged on these issues. What do you believe the Department can do to expand awareness of these critical career counseling programs and opportunities and help to increase participation? Uh, thank you for your question. Since we're showering praise on Bruce, I think one of the things is the Regional Administrator from the Department of Labor could hold up what Northeast Florida is doing and share that with other workforce boards so that when we find somebody that's doing it right, when we find somebody that has employers engaged, job attached training, that we as the Department of Labor amplify that and in essence put our arm around that and say, yes, that's good. We wanna see this more. We wanna see folks do this in Nevada and in Colorado and Michigan and Washington. That's great. So create a mechanism to share best practices. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize uh, Mr. Walbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thanks to the panel for being here. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to wave on to this committee, a committee that was long very close to my heart with what you do here. Um, America's workforce uh, needs uh, have drastically uh, changed and uh, how Americans access education and workforce development has changed as well. Um, and there are many good changes that offer opportunities. Uh, through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, WIOA, we have an opportunity to address America's workforce challenges to bring more employers to the table and offer innovative ways to reskill and upskill workers. Today, I introduced uh, with my colleague, Representative Blunt Rochester, the Immersive Technology for American Workforce Act, which would help job seekers gain the skills they need through programs that utilize immersive technology or virtual reality. I've seen how immersive technologies, uh, including augmented and virtual reality tools, can be used to upskill workers in the telecommunications industry, advanced manufacturing, and also in healthcare. Now, these technologies have the potential to lower training costs and improve safety while paving the way for individuals to pursue good-paying careers. A 
Across the country, businesses are struggling to find employees to meet the ever-growing demand in the skilled trades or technical fields. Our bill would enable Americans in rural and underserved areas to utilize immersive technologies to pursue career development and better access quality job development courses. And so, Ms. Logan, um, in your testimony, you discussed about uh, how IBM is partnering with innovative education providers to expand career opportunities for millions of Americans. Thank you for that. Uh, as we think about ways to deliver more skills uh, development through the public workforce system, how can we encourage more engagement from employers who uh, want to offer innovative skill development opportunities? Um. Thank you for the question. We believe that certainly transparency and quality in programs that are offered are one way to make sure that employers are at the table, making sure that they are connected to the, that the programs that are offered locally are connected to the needs of the employers, the, opportun the job opportunities that are there so that the pipeline of people being skilled are, are the ones being prepared for the jobs that are available. We also believe that we need to look at some of the reforms to the, to the programs so that we're not just looking at the brick and mortar providers, but we're looking at quality providers that may be online and other modalities that will help people learn at the place, pace, and path that's right for them. We cannot leave anyone uh, behind when we're looking at finding talent. Employers need to fill jobs to keep our economy strong and, and to keep our local economies going. Thank you. And I guess this, this definitely starts at the early, early ages to start young people thinking about what could be potential for the values that they share in their life. Um, that includes finding ways to get parents um, to start reacting differently to uh, appropriate educational opportunities that may be different than what they plan for their young people as well, and to foster the desire to uh, look for ways that will get them to the marketplace, which oftentimes seems to make them want to expand that in the future. Are we looking at ways through business and industry, and I guess I could ask any of you to respond to that, to really start addressing that um, to, to in, um, introduce and even inoculate people against um, certain perceptions of certain jobs uh, and start to introduce them to the fact that this any job can be expansive opportunity and unique cre creative training courses can assist in that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to jump in if possible yeah. because I, I appreciate the question and I think one of the, the barriers to entry for the apprenticeship program that we found was, was speaking to the point that you're talking about. Parents, parents oftentimes look at an apprenticeship as something less than. It's not, I, I had hoped that John would go to college and I don't want John to be an apprentice. Not realizing exactly what an apprentice is. It's a job attached training program that we know, I, I forget the representative who mentioned it earlier, it's about a 94% tension rate and it's a $70,000 starting salary across the board for apprenticeships. So we know that's a proven model but it's getting past the stigma of, oh, an apprenticeship, I'm, I'm going to do an apprenticeship, I'm not going to college. To speak to your earlier point about vocation, or, um, VR, I, I couldn't agree more. When I was at the Department of Labor, we launched a pilot with the Job Corps program to try to bring virtual reality headsets into some of our Job Corps centers so that we could allow career exploration for the students, but also allow training for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's real value in, in looking at things a little bit differently, trying some new things, encouraging, getting people comfortable with doing it a little bit differently. Virtual reality to bring out reality <laughs> for the future. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walburn, appreciate it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I want to, uh, as we start our closing comments, to, to uh, recognize uh, Ranking Member Ms. Wilson. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Owens. And thank you so much again to our witnesses for being with us today. As I said at the start of this hearing, investing in WIOA and skills development is one of the best things we can do to boost our economy. I'm grateful for our productive discussion on the steps that would and would not meaningfully update our workforce system. We have our work cut out for us, and we may not see eye to eye all the time. But politics aside, 
let us agree on this. A WIOA reauthorization must cater to the needs of diverse job seekers and ensure workforce investment helps businesses. I look forward to working with Chair Owens on a bipartisan WIOA reauthorization that delivers on these commitments and meets the needs of workers and businesses. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to just say thank you um, so much. I think that we're having a very helpful conversation. You know, there's a lot of bad things that happen to COVID. Uh, one of the good things is innovators are, ste are stepping to the plate, and I appreciate that in so many ways. Uh, we talk about supply chain, and we know that uh, we're having issues in so many ways, but the greatest danger to our country is, is our workforce supply chain, chain not, having, not being prepared to take us to the next level. Uh, I, I looked up the, um, for those just want to remind what, what WIOA means, W-I-O-A, is Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. I think the key word to that is innovation, and we seem to have forgotten that. I think we have to also understand we have, we have a partnership here. Uh, there's the government and there's the innovators, and we both have our parts, and there's both weaknesses and strengths. So I just, as I was kind of thinking about some of the weaknesses and strengths of both, this is a mindset, and the mindset is real. Uh, the weaknesses of the government mindset is that it is risk averse. Uh, it is, does sprint away from accountability and transparency. It seems to grow itself versus looking at the matrix that will grow success in the, in the mission statement. Uh, the, upside, the upside is that it's funded, but it's funded by taxpayers. So unfortunately with that, throwing money at the wall is very easy to do. So we have to make sure that we bring that accountability into it. The other side is innovation, the innovators. Innovators are all about profit. And that means they have to bring the best product and the best talent and the whole of that talent. That is what makes this whole process work. And um, so that's the upside is the, 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 the weakness is there's lack of funding. So therefore scaling of a good idea sometimes is very more difficult. What we have to do is this very simply is, is work across the aisle and realize we're fighting for the soul of our country right now. We need to make sure that our, our people, old and young, have hope. And they can only do that they have, they feel they have the skill set, they have a dream, they can know how to go out there and go through the ups and downs and know they're gonna land up on the right side. So we have to, and I'm thankful again for what you're doing right now. Cannot wait. Just know that we have a Congress now. We have a, uh, a conference that believes very simply we need to be innovative in our legislative process. We can only do that by hearing from the innovators. What works? What, what's outside the box we don't understand? We'll never understand here in D.C. And if we're open to that, then we'll make sure our country comes back really, really strong. And, and I look forward to that, concept, that, that process, and I think we're going to do very well with that. So I want to thank you guys again for being here. Uh, I would like to... Um, uh, take the time, okay, for taking the time uh, for, for coming to testify for the subcommittee today. And without objections, uh, there being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you so much.